he was responsible for the eradication of hydrogen gas which causes uh, smallpox. Dr. Frank Penner. Before his death, he gave a statement which has come out in the international paper. Humans will be extinct in hundred years. They will be extinct in hundred years. And he gives two reasons for that. The first reason that he gives, gives is consumerism. And the second that he gives is population growth. On the second point, of course, I uh, disagree a little. But on the first point, uh, I agree fully and I shall establish that. Now, <clears throat> I told you that the world is in a very uh, serious situation. Poets and seers, they are seers. They understood earlier that this is going to happen. You know W.B. Yeats, the English poet, who wrote the introduction to Tegos in Gitanjali. He was the man who read in 1912 in Hampstead Hill in the house of William Rothenstein, where all the galaxies of England were there, uh, and before them, it is WBS who read Gitanjali, and one year later he got the win by WBS in one of his points, he writes, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the ceremony of innocence is drowned, the blood dim tide is loosed, the best lack all convictions and the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's how he described the world in the beginning of the 20th century. And in the middle of the 20th century, one of our Bengali poets, very famous post tegorian Bengali poet, he wrote these lines that Almut Adhara Geshe Pijimitya, the strange darkness has descended on this world. Those who are blind may see the most. This kind of grotesque world that we are in, that is, poets and seers see this. And in our country, Gandhiji and Tagore saw this much earlier that yes, it is coming. <coughs> Tagore, in 1904, he writes the famous essay called Swadeshi Shaman. How you know that Tagore lived for 10 years in village. His father sent him to East Bengal to live in village and see the Jamil that. And when he lived there for 10 years, he saw the life of the people in the villages. And that really gave him the impetus also to start Shanti in 1901. Uh, Brahmacharya Ashram and later on it was named the Shanti Niketan. And a few years later he starts Shri And through Shri he he's going around the villages of uh, uh, around Shanti Niketan to do developmental work of his kind. Of his kind. And you remember that he sent his son, Rochindranath Tagore, a very gifted man, to America not to study uh, uh, that what the uh, elites of India were doing. They are sending us some to England or places to learn barrister, to become the barrister or to become the doctor or to become engineer. He sends his son to learn um, agriculture. He sends, he sends his son-in-law also to America to learn agriculture. He, he sends one of his trusted teachers, Santosh Kumar Mojunda, to America to learn dairy. So that when they come back, they can, this understanding that they have, they can utilize that in changing the village life of uh, India. Now, in 1905, he writes the famous article called Lose of Luxury, Vilashir Khan. Lose of Luxury, in which he uh, talks like this, I shall quote from him. In 1922, he writes a play called Mukto Dhara. Mukto means uh, free stream. In that he breaks a dam, and the Rajkumar is. And if you listen to the uh, words of the uh, villagers who live in the downstream, you will feel as if Medapatkar is speaking. That, that that's uh, Tagore in 1922. In 1924, he writes that famous famous drama called Rakhtabaradi, read only in there which is a great critic of the modern industrial society, where humans are known as numbers. Number one, number two, number three. <coughs> now, in 1924, he went to China. And in 24 in China, he speaks like this. I shall quote from him. Uh, from him. 
for over a century, this one take over, I am verbatically uh, quoting him, for over a century, we are being dragged by the prosperous West behind his chariot, choked by the dust, deafened by the noise, humbled by our own helplessness, and we agree to acknowledge that this chariot drive is progress, and that progress is civilization. If anyone ventured to ask progress towards what, progress for whom, it was considered to be peculiarly, ridiculously oriental to entertain such doubts about the absoluteness of progress. Of late, a voice has come which is bidding us to take count of not only the scientific perfection of the chariot, but also the depth of ditches lying across its path. What is this chariot? What is the depth of ditches? We see it today. The breakdown of society, the breakdown of nature, all the which is taking place today, which is making this earth perhaps humans will vanish, as Frank Fenner says. Now Gandhiji, in the same vein, he writes, God forbid, India should ever take to industrialization in the manner of the West. A tiny idle kingdom, that's England, is today keeping the whole world in chains. If an entire nation of 300 million, that is India, at that time we had 30 crore, took to similar kind of economic exploitation, the whole world will be bare like locust. Locust don't they know? छोटे से पतंग होते हैं, वो जब लाखों लाखों आते हैं, बैठते हैं, तो फिर इशारा बहुत दिख रहा है। So he says like this. Now I can understand today the meaning of this word. Why? Today a new concept has come. But it's difficult to speak before Shankar Dhala, who is a great expert in all this. But still, then <coughs> let me try. Let me try. <coughs> he says. Uh, 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 there's a new concept which has come as the ecological footprint. Have you heard about it? Ecological footprint? Now the footprint that I am making now is this area. About say three or four square feet. When I go back home, I have a place say 800, 800 uh, 2000 square feet home. When I eat vegetable, to grow that I need some land. When I take fish, I need some water body where that fish can be reared. If I, when I take meat, I need some grazing land where the, uh, uh, the uh, elements could graze. Now, sign, uh, and then when I breathe out, it, without carbon dioxide, it needs some trees to take that carbon dioxide. Now, scientists have calculated what is the carrying capacity of earth. And it says that it is 1.9 hectare. This is a little dated uh, statistics. It might have changed now. 1.9 hectare per person. 1.9 hectare is about uh, four and a half acres. <coughs> about four and a half acres. That much of land is the carrying capacity of land. Beyond that, it will be disastrous. Now, then, say so maybe this statics may be about eight or ten years back, it is worse now, must be worse now, with the glittering shopping malls which I see in the Indian cities. The situation is very, very serious now. But then, at that time, Already it was 2.3 hectare per person. That means 20 percent more than the carrying capacity of Earth. This is the average of the whole world. Now, what about America? How much ecological footprint America is giving? America is giving 10 hectares per person. Australia is giving 8 hectares per person. Europe is giving 5 hectares per person. But what about Asia and Africa? This is only 1.4 to 1.5 hectare. It might have increased now because of China's progress, China's change that has come during this last 10, 15, 20 years. But then this was the figure some time back that Asia and Africa is only one, that means much less than the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is 1.9 hectare per person, it is 1.45. And this, here lives the majority of the people of India, India, Asia and Africa. Majority of people live here. So these people are poor. Their consumption from nature is very little. Their demand from nature is very little. <coughs> so they are not really spoiling the earth. The whole spoiling of the earth, the whole devastation that is taking place is because of the rich few of the world and the absolute middle class of the world. Of which in India, we have about 25 crores. 21 crore middle class and 4 crore rich. Their consumerism is, I shall come to that, <coughs> now, scientists have also uh, warned that humans, you have been 
given the power to think, think properly. What he says, Lee's Pascal. Lee's Pascal, those who do science, they know Pascal's law. Uh, Sagar knows it. Pascal's law. Uh, Pascal was 21 years senior to Newton. He was born in 1621. Pascal writes in one of his essays that humankind is a very small link in the immense wave of nature. It is the only species on earth which has been given the power to think. And through thought, it can understand nature and can change nature for better or for worse. So this is a warning which has given to mankind that you have been given the power to think and through thought, what should you do? You can devastate it, also you can make it better. So what, what I find today in the whole world that the, with the thought, with science, technology, industry and all that, what we are doing, we are devastating the world for... Now if I look at the situation of uh, people who live here in India, what is the situation of, say, now when we talk about env environment, uh, I don't only think about the uh, natural environment. I think uh, uh, we should think about also the social environment. This is not only, because unless you connect the both, you, you can't understand what is happening. So if you look at the uh, social environment, uh, our own India, our own India, what is the situation in our own India? I give you a little bit of the figures. Uh, India's current account balance in 2012-13 is 88 billion. This is 5,28,000 crore between the export import difference. This is 58,000 crores. 10 percent of rich, uh, rich of the India own 50 percent of the India's wealth. Only 10 percent. It might be more now. <coughs> import of oil. Every year we import oil more than 2 lakh uh, crores of rupees. Every year we are, uh, and this is increasing. Then import of coal. In 2012-13, we have imported 110 uh, million tons of coal, and the projection is that in 2017, we will uh, import 185 million tons of coal from Australia and other places. World Bank revealed that in India, environmental damage, damage knocks off knocks off how much amount of our GDP is 5.7 percent of our GDP is knocked off by because of environmental degradation. Now, in 1992, a report came from a nature which was reported in Down to Earth. I have got that issue. There, these two scientists of World Bank had made a, a calculation of the environmental degradation cost of India. What is the environmental degradation cost of India? And it was at that time about 45,000 crores. And it was about 4.5% of the GDP of India. Now, when this came, the uh, uh, you know Center for Science and Environment, who publishes down to work in Delhi, they worked on this report, and they found that the environmental degradation cost of India is 50 to 70 thousand crores, which is about seven to nine percent of the GDP of India. That means if we are going up by 4.5 percent in GDP, we are going down by seven to nine percent. In environmental degradation cause. We now will not perhaps understand fully the uh, repercussions of this. Our future generation who will be coming, they have to, uh, they will suffer because of this environmental degradation cause because nature will be completely despoiled. Nature will be completely despoiled for, uh, and uh, their natural resources will be devastated so that they have nothing to sustain on. So, <clears throat> No, that is what uh, Gandhiji uh, said, that it will bear like locust. If India and China, having a population of 225 crore or so, decide tomorrow, and it is a democratic world, why can't we live like an American? All Indian and Chinese people will live, live like an American. And we'll put a ecological footprint of 10 hectares per person. If we do that, then within a short few decades, the whole world will be bare like locust. The world is sustaining because the poor people of the world, they don't consume, they don't consume. <coughs> so, now, let, this, let me uh, again recollect, maybe uh, this is known to you. What was the condition of India before we had uh, colonized by the 
uh, Britishers. I shall give you a little bit of statistics. <coughs> Around the time of Battle of Palasi, 1757 Battle of Palasi, okay, and the Indian subcontinent accounted for 2.5% uh, of 25% uh, of the GDP of the world in 1757. China, it was 30% of the total GDP of the world, it was 30%. That was the situation in 1750 before the Britishers colonized us. Then, in 1760, the industrial production, what was happening at then, the, the textile in Hyderabad, you know that steel was being produced. Do you know that? I've been there, Pona Shomudram. I've been in Telangana, a place called Pona Shomudram, where huge slacks, an American uh, exp uh, uh, a metallurgist was working on that. He was staying here in the Manjara Hill in a hotel and he hired a motorcycle and scoured the whole of Telangana and discovered 90 sites of iron and quite a few sites of steel. We are producing steel which is going to Batavia in Indonesia, which was going to uh, Persia to make uh, Damascus swords. It was in the 19th century. Till. We are making zinc and zinc was being transported from here, exported from here to England and in Bristol, and there are records now, I did an, we did an exhibition for our uh, National Council on 5,000 years of Indian science, and we took it to America for two, 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 two years, we visited six cities, and in that, we had a, a section on zinc, <coughs> and zinc was being produced here in India, and when I uh, was researching on this, I found that one William Chop, chairman of Bristol, where our zinc was going on export, he had taken a patent. So I got the patent from there. And I see that the patent, the design of the patent is very much like the uh, furnace which was discovered in the mid-1980s in Jawar. Jawar where the uh, uh, zinc mine is there. So we, uh, the heading was, did zinc begin in India? That was a question mark. Because before that, zinc was not manufactured in this. That was the cementation process uh, was a quite different thing. But we are producing zinc in a different way completely, and it was going to. So we, uh, in, at that time, India and China, India and China, 73 percent of Indian industrial production was going from India and China. 73 percent of even in 1860 when the industrial revolution was being completed. This was going. This, uh, uh, it was about 60 percent. It was 60 percent. If you take, if you, if you take the total economic production of the world, 80 percent of the economic production of the world was going from Asia. That was the situation, and this whole situation changed after the colonization. After the colonization took place. <coughs> now, <coughs> this, now what about the? This is the condition of the third world. Third world collapsing, collapsing economically. But what is the situation of the uh, uh, rich people of the world? What is the the richest country in the world is United States of America, isn't it? America. What is the situation of America? I shall read to you a, from a small passage from uh, a lecture given by an American thinker in one of our World Congress of Museums. I went to museums. So then every three years we have a World Conference, and this was being held in Den Haag in Holland. I was present there. And uh, Neil Postman, he was called to give the keynote address there. And what does he say in that keynote address? I shall read it to you, uh, a small passage from that. <coughs> what has happened to America? He says, he says in his lecture, what has, what has technology given us to the Americans? We have, we have already organize our society to accommodate every possible technological innovation. We have deliriously, mindlessly, willingly <coughs> ignored all consequences of our action. And have because technology requires it, we have turned our back on history, children, religion, family and education. And as a result of what we have done, American civilization is collapsing. This he is saying in 1989. 1989. This was his statement that he gave. Then he says, all Americans know this to be true, but they seem powerless in the face of it. 
they know this is a situation that the American civilization is collapsing. <coughs> then he gives a harrowing account of the American society. He says that by 1995, that means 89 to 95, means within six years or so, 85 <coughs> percent of the American children will live in one parent home, broken families, broken families. He says fewer than 50 percent of our children graduate from high school, and that is from a culture which invented, he says, which invented the idea of education for the masses. By age 18, an American child sees 16,000 hours of, uh, uh, of uh, television, and by age 20, 1 million television commercial that is seen by an American child on an average, on an average. And he says. 25%, this was a news to me, that 25% of American population is illiterate. They, know, they don't know how to read and write. That was in 89 that he said. Then he gives a harrowing account of the American society, ending with that our youngsters are frying their brains with drugs. That's how he's writing. This is the richest country in the world, which has, which has and it is the longest and the highest indebted country in the whole world. It is sustaining because of some other. The economists will tell you why it is sustaining in spite of the fact that its, it's uh, debt is about, uh, it is 15.77 trillion dollars is the debt of America. It is the largest and the longest indebted country in the whole world. So he gives a, also a figure, this figure has been noted only, uh, I think, two years back, that what is the situation, how many people are unemployed? How many people have health insurance? How many people have partial insurance? How many have free dole? How many I have seen that. I have been to Charlotte to install this exhibition, science exhibition that we do. And I saw on this fruit, uh, uh, footpath, four or five old Americans, both white and uh, black, they are defecating there. And every day, this, the uh, uh, shopkeeper is cleaning this. I asked one shopkeeper, why, are you, why, why do you allow them? Then he said that they are our burglar seller. If they don't stay, my shop may be burgled. That is what he said. Now, <clears throat> now, this is the situation of the society in which we are living, where the both the... Now, let me tell you what Tegod is saying. Tegod is saying... Now, this is today's newspaper. Today's newspaper. France is crumbling. This today's newspaper, local newspaper. Eh? And Greece, the economy is crumbling. Iceland, the economy is crumbling. So the whole capitalist economy is in great crisis. America has recovered a little, but then the crisis is still there. Now, rich and poor divide is increasing all over the world. In 1920, the richest country and the poorest country, the national income was only three is to one. If the richest country is to earn three national income, then the poorest country was one. And it became 100 is to one in 2000, 2018. So the rich and poor divide all over the world is gallopingly increasing. So let me, let me tell you how Kegur is thinking. In 1930, in Shantinikadan, before the villagers, it is in Bengali, I have translated it in English with my inept capacity of English. I am not trained in an English medium school. He says to the villagers, it is necessary to tell you a fact. Many of you will not be able to feel how much true is the fact. I never could imagine that I shall witness so much of distress from different countries in the West. They are not in happiness. There is no doubt that large amounts of good, lots of good have been accumulated. But there is deep untrust all around. People cannot ever remain connected to each other in cities. You don't have to go to go so far. Look at Calcutta. In Calcutta, where we stay, and the place you know, we know, there is no relation with the neighbor, with the neighbor in their happiness and in their sadness or during some mishappening. Alienation. And if you, this alienation is creeping all over the world. If you have read, if you have read uh, T.S. Eliot, T.S. Eliot, the great English poet, Rognath Tegur has translated one poem of his, uh, Journey to Magi. Uh, 
T.S. Eliot writes in one of his poems that the desert is not only in the southern tropics. In the southern tropics, most of the deserts are there. So he says, desert is not only in the southern tropics. The desert is around the corner. The desert is squeezed in the tube train and the desert is in the heart of your neighbor. That is what Tegoli is also saying. That between one and the other. I go from uh, uh, Munich to Ulm, two hours journey on train. Ulm where Einstein was born, I was going. And a German citizen was sitting in front, reading a newspaper. And for two hours I was bubbling to talk to him, an Indian. Who were you piling here? He was reading, he was reading. No communication. There are sarcastic films that I have seen in America about this uh, alienation, about this alienation. So this is what uh, Tagore writes. In Tagore, he wrote four articles on cooperative. You know that the Nobel Prize money that he got, a large part of it he invested in the village bank, cooperative bank. He, he invested that there. In an article, Rules of Cooperative, he also made a constitution of the co cooperative. It was written in 1928. What does he write? Social wellness. Samajikata. What do you say? Samajikata. Samajikona. Samajikata. Social? Socialization is the heart of village. The <coughs> socialization can never be attained, achieved in, town, in a town. One reason for this is that as town is large, social relations becomes loose. <clears throat> Another reason is that because of business and other special needs and opportunities, uh, cities population becomes large. <clears throat> Their humans primarily want to satisfy its own uh, essential needs, not each other's. Due to this, even when people are living in the same locality, they don't feel ashamed if they don't know each other. <coughs> With the complication of our life, uh, the alienation gradually is growing. That is what I told, uh, I, I, I quoted from uh, T.S. Eliot also, he is talking about the same thing. Now, in the rules of cooperative, again, what he is writing, in the rules of cooperative, he writes, the villages encircle the town from all sides. Such unnatural dis dissimilarities can never be good. It is necessary to state that this is not true only for our country. This is the common symptom of the present age. In reality, this seed of social alienation from West has spread all over the world. From Western countries has spread all over the world. <coughs> this not only harms the happiness and peace of mankind, it is killing the clean from inside, killing from inside. <clears throat> so this problem has to be considered by the people of all countries. That is what he writes. Now this is what is happening all over the world. This is regarding the society. But nature also is collapsing. And it's not necessary to tell you the, the most important collapse that is taking place is regarding the is regarding the what is the most important collapse that is taking place of which we are all concerned about climate change global warming and climate change and the uh, the recent report that has come for the first time in this report they are saying that our lifestyle has to be changed. I have got this report here. The lifestyle has to be changed. This report says the lifestyle has to be changed. The lifestyle is responsible for this. I shall tell you that how this lifestyle is. But then in this, uh, there are a lot, in, in, there can be uh, two or three lectures that Dr. Shakadhara can give on climate change. But I shall refer to uh, three or four points. Uh, one is, the melting of the glaciers and the melting of the Arctic and breaking down of the ice in the Antarctic. If the Antarctic ice, Western Antarctic, never it has happened, but this is happening. If all this ice melts, then the sea level will rise to a great, great extent. <laughs> Cities like Calcutta, New York and all these will be underwater. But uh, Arctic ice, the scientists are telling that it will be within a few decades, 
all arctic ice will melt what is the impact of that arctic ice it reflects the sun rays which come it is reflected that's called albedo albedo so if all these melt and becomes water the albedo will stop and that will increase the global warming moreover so moreover in this ice there is a deposition of calcareth calcareth is methane there is deposition of methane and if all this melt then the methane will be released and you know that methane is nearly 20 to 21 times more greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide than carbon dioxide so that will be released there is one more thing that might happen <coughs> you know this temperature of the earth the balance is done by the thermohaline circulation gulf stream takes the heat from the equatorial region and takes the heat goes to the north it goes and then cools the uh, it heats the upper region and when this gulf stream comes between greenland and iceland by this time lot of Uh, water vapor has evaporated and the density of water increases and millions of gallons of water they go down go down becomes cold and bring the cold water like a conveyor belt down to the south and thereby cool the equatorial region so this is like a conveyor belt this circulation is going on and in 2000 we made this is called thermohaline circulation thermo means temperature haline is salty so thermohaline circulation the 2008 it slowed down it happened so in 10800 years back and there was there was ice age which dawned in the northern part of the world ice age came so there is a fear that if all the ice there melt in the arctic ocean the thermohaline circulation may be jeopardized so this is the other uh, great danger that is uh, happening so i shall not speak about the all the i speak a sentence for the uh, football bill equivalent of forest vanish from earth uh, uh, when i uh, started giving this talk in the uh, uh, in 1985 or so it was 15.4 million hectares of forest was being uh, the, uh, uh, was being removed and i got from last year or year before last i got the figure that even after all these conferences the stockholm conference the rio conference the sustainable development conference in johannesburg it is still now 13.5 million hectares the carbon dioxide is rising every year perhaps 2% or 2.5% carbon dioxide is rising the need of energy is rising like this so <clears throat> you take any biodiversity loss every day about 10 to 100 species are getting extinct and humans will become extinct within 100 years as dr frank has said you must be the perhaps the, the, the most intelligent species cutting their own grave will become extinct if we go like this uh, that is what hansen and others uh, james hansen you have heard the name of james hansen the great climatologist uh, was the director of the goddard institute of space studies in america he was he is one of the first who made the world aware about the climate change and he said that we have 10 years 10 years not to think this this he said about 5 or 6 years back it came out in the in the, in the journal that we have only 10 years 10 years not to think but to act upon if we have to stop the catastrophe the same thing was told by another scientist james rablock in his book uh, the uh, guy the, the, the originator of gaia theory the, he said that the temperature may, may, may go to 6 to 8 degrees celsius and only a few among the billions will survive so this is what is happening in, in, in the world so the nature is crumbling you take any parameter if you take the parameter like climate change deforestation biological extinction water crisis land degradation and desertification pollution of air and water oil spills in the oceans toxic waste toxic toxic and hazardous waste ozone hole over fishing and marine pollution melting of glacier all this is happening in the world today in a great great to be and this is all happening because of one factor the gluttonous consumerism of the rich few of the world what is the consumerism let me give you a very simple statistics you can understand ah, the change that is taking place saraswati gluttonous consumerism 1800 is the middle of the industrial revolution 1760 to 
1800. In the middle of industrial revolution, when an American goes to the market, he can buy only 300 items in a market space of 1500 square feet. 30 feet by 50 feet, 50 feet. That's the space for the market. Okay? In 1800. And in 2000, when an American goes to the market, what is the choice that he gets? In place of 300, he gets a choice of 10 lakh like items, 1 million items. And the market space of, feet, instead of 1500 square feet, he gets a choice of 1 crore 50 lakh square feet. 1 crore 50 lakh square feet. 1.5 million square meter. If you multiply by 10, approximately it becomes a square meter. Okay. This is what is really coming the earth. And <laughs> our great writer Mark Twain, uh, he wrote that civilization is nothing but a uh, limitless expansion of unnecessary necessities. Limitless expansion. Go to the market and see who goes there. I go to the South City Mall, which is a very new construction, huge South City Mall. Who goes there? The type of people who go there. And literally, materials which are there, nothing. I have got the figures of only a few items, only a few items which are not essential need of man. How much amount of dollar is being spent? This is even statistic of 2001. I don't, I don't give it to you. So this is what is happening. The huge amount of goods that is produced for the delectation of the rich and the middle class. Our tribals there in the Niamgiri forest, our tribals there in the jungle mahal of uh, West Bengal, they don't consume. Their needs from society, uh, from, from, from the economy and from the country is very, very little. It is the rich few and the middle class, 25 crore Indian rich and the middle class. They are responsible all in the world, the rich countries of the world, because of their gluttonous consumerism, that is. Uh, Epicurus, you have heard the name of Epicurus, like our Charva, in the same time, 6th century BC, the philosopher on whom Karl Marx had did his uh, dissertation, doctors on uh, Epicurus. Epicurus wrote, for some, enough is not enough, for whom enough is little. That's what uh, Epicurus write. So, <coughs> This is the situation in which we are in the year is coming. Then what did Tagore and Gandhi uh, said how to resurrect this situation? I said just uh, go to that. Let me go to that item. There is one, one thing that I should, that you know that in 15th, 16th century three things happened in the whole world and that changes the situation. One is the scientific revolution, scientific revolution maturing in 17th century, the birth of Newton. The other is colonization, the exploration and discoveries of from um, uh, the hundreds of dis discoverers, explorers they went and they colonized the whole world, they colonized the whole world, uh, scientific revolution and then uh, Renaissance in Europe. These three completely changes the whole world, leading to the Industrial Revolution in between 76 to 1830. And Industrial Revolution changes the whole situation. Before the Industrial Revolution, whatever production was made in the whole world, it was made primarily for the local use. But after the Industrial Revolution, market was established. So, one great English historian, he says, it is not worthwhile for any entrepreneur to start an enterprise unless he has command over two things. One is capital, the other is market. And that capital started arriving there in Europe with various colonization, with silver from mosquito, with slave labor and all that. The capital started accumulating. Primitive accumulation of capital started. And the market was established. And, and Gandhiji, what did, what did he say about this? Let me, let me tell, uh, give you a, 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 a small write-up from Gandhiji. What does he say, he say about the uh, industrialization? Just me. It's a wonderful, wonderful write-up. Just me. Uh, Gandhiji wrote, Industrialism is, I am afraid, giving, uh, going to be a curse for mankind. Exploitation of one nation by another nation cannot go for all the time. 
Industrialism depends entirely on your capacity to exploit on foreign markets being open to you and absence of competition. India, when it, be, when it begins to exploit other nations as it must if it becomes industrialized, will be a curse for other nations, a menace to mankind. This is what he writes there. And he says, <coughs> it is a folly to believe that an Indian Rockefeller is better than an American Rockefeller. That is what he writes. Now, this is... So, the scientific revolution, the method of science was given by two persons. One is Francis Bacon, the other is René Descartes, the mathematician, the philosopher in France. Ron Descartes, he says, and both of these talks about becoming the master of nature. I can quote from Descartes where he says like this. Descartes says in his method, discourse on method, we can have useful knowledge by which cognizant of the forces and action of fire, water, air, the stars, the heavens and all other bodies which surround us Knowing them as distinctly as we know the various crafts of artisan, we may be able to apply them in the same fashion to every use to which they are suited and thus make ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. This is what is the problem. We are becoming masters. We are not a part of nature. We are not a part of nature. We are part of nature. Karl Marx's wonderful uh, 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 passage about this, that we are a part of nature. Now, this is Judeo-Christian in attitude. In the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, Bible, it says like this, God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have command over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over everything that moveth the earth. Have command over it. This is purely, Descartes saying is more or less Judeo-Christian saying. Now, Descartes says, if you want to understand nature's process, break it into small parts and then look at the small parts. Now, this breaking up of the small things into small parts creates a danger of, we forget the whole. And Friedrich Engels, the associate of Karl Marx, in 19th century, he <coughs> says like this, the danger of breaking things apart, how he says, the analysis of nature into its constituent parts, where the fundamental conditions for the gigantic strides made in our knowledge of nature. Without that, you can't do science. Breaking things apart. If you don't break away the matters, you can't understand the molecule. If you don't break the molecule, you can't understand the... Then you have to break that also. Two protons must collide and Higgs motion has to be found out. So this is the principle on which science... But then this also creates a problem which Engels is referring to. That just made strides have been made in our uh, knowledge of nature during the last 400 years. But the method of investigation has also left us a legacy of the habit of observing nature, natural objects and natural processes in their isolation detached from the past interconnections of things. Which Blaise Pascal says, man is a part of the immense wave of nature. So this is happening that we take out the soil bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis splices with the cotton gene, and we say that we have created new life. But what kind of danger it may create, we, don't, we are not aware of. So I not, shall not. Yeah. Then what Tagore is saying, what has to be done? What Gandhi is saying, I shall, I shall uh, do that. Give me 15 minutes more time. Okay. Our society cannot remain. This is Swadeshi Shamal in 1904. Tagore is writing. Swadeshi Shamal. Our society cannot continue like this. Because powerful outside force is engulfing our society every moment. It is united, it is strong, it has made it visible by its total control of our schools to every market. You see, as if he is talking about uh, the situation of uh, retail, uh, bringing in FDI in retail. He is talking about this and the control of education that is taking place, foreign can, uh, uh, money coming. He is saying, that it has made it visible by its total control of our schools, schools to everyday market. If society has to defend itself from, from this, it has to stand on its own feet. 
Swabalamban. Swabalamban. Every single person of our society has to sacrifice a little every, every day by, uh, for the country. We have to rejuvenate our country by bringing a change in our villages, village society that is uh, connected in many ways. He, 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 use a, uh, he uses a word in Bengali, Bohu Shambhanda Vishishto. In the village society is all related to each other. Bohu Shambhanda Vishishto. Okay? Now, in again, poverty, they say, which he wrote in 1922 uh, uh, on self reliance. We have to remember, you have to reconstruct all the villages to satisfy all our needs. How Shavalamban is being talked about in 1920 by Tagore. Listen to it. We have to, we have to reconstruct all our villages to satisfy all our needs. It is necessary to form a zone like our panchayat. It is necessary to form a zone. It is, it is, uh, if the heads of the zones, uh, if the heads of the zones uh, can organize all works and redress all deficiencies by themselves, only then the cultivation of self-rule will become true all over the country. It is necessary to help and inspire the villagers to start their own school. Talk about the self and see what he says. To start their own school, cooperative, bank. By this way, if the villagers become self-reliant and united, then only we'll be able, we'll be saved. Our greatest problem is how to reconstruct our village society. That is what he writes. Then again, in Shadeshi Shamas, 1904, what he writes. <coughs> If you want to change this, a counter culture has to be created. Because cultural hegemony through the media and others is gripping the minds of the people of India and the third world. Even in the villages also, this is gripping. This is called cultural hegemony that is taking place. Control the mind. Always advertisement. Control the mind. And if you can control the mind, then your market will be established. So what Tegur is selling? <coughs> For ages, a counterculture. For ages, people have been, have been given the test of literature and spiritual education through various festivals. For various reasons, today's Jamindas are not attracted towards the city. Uh, Jamindas are attracted towards the cities. Due to these, villages of Bengal have become joyless uh, gradually. <coughs> That's so the reason why the literature that nurses the minds of the old and the young of the country be, uh, becomes unavailable to the common man. If you can again resurrect the flow of literature and joy in the villages of Bengal through such village fairs, then the heart of green cropland Bengal will not become a dry desert day by day. That is what he is talking about. Uh, finish, 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 finish. Now what does, what does Gandhi says? With that I shall finish. Gandhi in 1945, <coughs> 5th of October, writes a letter to Nehru, what kind of India you want to build? If there is a basic difference between you and me, the country must know about it. And then he says that, I am convinced that if India has to attain true freedom, and through India the whole world also, then sooner or later the fact must be recognized that people have to live in villages, not in towns, in huts, not in, not in palaces. Crores of people will never be able to live at peace with each other in towns and palaces. They will have then no other recourse but to take to violence and untruth. He says that my village will not be village of today. You must not imagine that I am envisaging our village as it is today. The village of my dream is still there. My ideal village uh, will contain intelligent human beings. They will not live in the dark and darkness. Men and women will be 